Hey everybody, in today's video I finally get to talk to you about the Nikon Z8. It's official, it exists. I know that you've all been talking about this for the past year or so. As soon as the Z9 launched, everyone was like, oh, I wonder what the Z8 would look like. But it's here, it officially exists. So in today's video, we're going to be talking about the camera itself, specifications. Also, as you all probably guessed, I've been using the Z8 for the past few months. I'm just going to talk about some of my own experiences, what I've shot with this camera. I've been taking this camera to loads of different locations to visit lots of different photographers. Some of them you'll see me in the video, some of them you won't, but I'll be there in the background. So this camera spent a lot of time with me over the past couple of months and it's been really exciting to use this and test some of its features. And we're going to talk about some of those things that I've found in today's video. So first things first, let's get the easy stuff out of the way. The Nikon Z8 has a lot, pretty much almost everything borrowed from the Z9. It is effectively a Nikon Z9 in a smaller, lighter body. It has the same processor, the same sensor, the same megapixel count, the same focusing system. They record the same video quality, 8K, internal, raw. It's not like Nikon have limited this camera in any way, shape or form. All they've literally done is made a Z9 smaller and internally it does all the same things. If anything, there are a couple of things that have been added to the Z8 that you won't find in the Z9. Let's start talking about some of the internals. So this does use a 45 megapixel stacked backlit CMOS sensor. Because this sensor is stacked, that does mean that it will read out 12 times faster than the 45 megapixel sensor that you'll find in the Z7 and the Z7 II. So yes, the megapixel count is the same, but the sensor is completely different. The Z9 and the Z8 share the same stacked 45 megapixel sensor. That 45 megapixel stacked sensor does not have an optical low pass filter. So you are still gonna get increased resolution and increased detail versus a camera that does have an optical low pass filter. The sensor does have coatings in front of it to help with dust and to stop things sticking to it, but it does not have an optical low pass filter. That 45 megapixel sensor does sit inside a five axis in-body stabilization system. That can give you up to six stops of VR, vibration reduction, when used with the right lens. So whether it's a lens with VR itself, because a lot of Nikon Z lenses have VR elements built into them as well, so depending on the lens you're using it, you can get up to six stops of VR. One thing that I really like about Nikon's in-body stabilization implementation is that when the camera is turned off, it locks in place. There are a lot of other cameras that when your camera's off, the in-body stabilization is free to move. And that can mean that if the camera is dropped, it can damage that as well. So that locking mechanism is also one of the reasons why it's always important to make sure you correctly turn your camera off rather than just pulling your battery out. Because when you turn the Z8 off, it will lock that VR mechanism in place to stop it from moving, to stop it from being damaged during transit, moving the camera around, having it in a backpack, walking down and up hills, for example. So I really like the idea of it being locked in place, just making it more secure and less likely to be damaged. So when it comes to the Z8's body itself, it does look very similar to a Z9. There are a lot of things that would easily pass over in being in the same place, in the right position, which means it's also not just a great camera in its own right, but also a great second camera to a Z9. So if you're already a Z9 shooter and you want a camera that's gonna work the same way as a Z9 does, then the Z8 is gonna fit in perfectly in that circumstance. To give you an idea about the size and the weight of this camera, it is 30% smaller than a Z9 and it is 15% smaller than a D850. So still smaller than a D850 if only marginal. In terms of weight, it is lighter than a D850 and obviously then lighter than a Z9 as well. So it weighs 910 grams, which is less than a kilo, whereas a D850 weighed just over one kilo, so slightly lighter than a D850 as well. Most of the layout is identical. There are a couple of small changes or small differences. The first one being the dial on the top left of the camera has gone, so you don't have a frames per second dial. You still have the four buttons along the top. Those buttons have also changed slightly. So we have bracketing, white balance now, mode, and then our frames per second or drive mode button. White balance has been swapped out for the flash mode button. So depending on what's more important to you, white balance or flash, whether or not that's gonna be a problem, but it's only a minor thing but you can still use the button on the top of the camera to control your frames per second directly. So if you want to be in single frame, 20 frames a second, 
30 frames a second, 60 frames a second, or 120 frames per second, you can choose that from the button on the top of the camera. This Z8 has all of the same drive modes and all of the same frames per second modes as you would get in a Z9. On the front of the camera, we will then have our function one and function two buttons, whereas on a Z9 you'd have function one, two, and three. So we've lost that function three button on the front of the camera. We do still keep the auto focusing button on the left hand side of the camera. This is a button that's been brought over from DSLRs. If you've ever used a D5, D6, D750, every large full frame Nikon DSLR always had a focusing button on that left hand side. So the Z9 and the Z8 bring that focusing button over onto that left hand side. When the Z9 was first launching, a couple of people thought that this was like a joystick or something like that. It's not. Um, this is a button that's related to autofocus. You push and hold it and it lets you change your focusing settings. You, there are also obviously lots of other ways that you can do that. We still do have a 10 pin port on the left hand side of the camera as well, matching the 10 pin port on the Z9. Moving over to the right hand side of the body, the card door is different. So the biggest thing to be aware of when it comes to memory cards is that both the Z8 and the Z9 will take different memory cards. So they will both allow you to have one slot which is CF Express or XQD. And then the Z9 has a second slot which is CF Express or XQD. Whereas the Z8 now uses an SD card. So an SD card and a CF Express card in the Z8. Also, the Z9's door is locking, whereas the Z8's door is not. It's not caused me too many issues, but there have been a couple of times where I've accidentally caught the door and it's popped open because I would have really liked this card door to be a locking door. In normal everyday shooting, as I say, it's not caused me too many problems, but when it's been on a tripod and I've been changing some buttons, um, every now and again I've caught it with the palm of my hand and that door can just be quite easily knocked open. So just something to be aware of. The display on the cameras is not only a tilting screen, but it is also a vertical tilting screen. So you can use the camera vertically, tilt that screen out. I really like the design of this screen, especially as a landscape and wildlife photographer. If I want to shoot vertical on a tripod or low to the ground, it's really easy for me to just have the camera low to the ground, screen flipped out. I can still see what I'm doing without me having to lie on the ground. That's also the same for wildlife photography. If I want my camera nice and low on a low tripod, I can still do that and see what's going on in the back screen of my camera without me having to physically lie on the floor to try and look through the screen. So this vertical flip out screen works really nicely for me. I really prefer this design of screen versus the screen that flips out towards the front. It is what it is. Everyone has their own preference, but I personally prefer this screen, especially from a photography point of view and also from a camera operator's point of view because the screen is in line with the middle of my lens, the middle of my frame. I always find that with a screen that flips out to the side, it's hard for me to figure out where exactly the frame is because it's over to the side. And also if the frame's level, it can be difficult to try and see if the screen's not quite straight. So screen design, same as the Z9, I really like it. I've been happy with it on my Z9 and I'm very, very glad to see that they've stuck the same screen on the back of the Z8. I really like how that screen works. Now, when it comes to ports, the Z8 will have the mic and headphone jack. We then have a full size HDMI port, which I'm very glad to see. And then we have two USB-C ports. So two USB-C ports, one of them is specifically for power and one of them is specifically for communication and data. So if you wanted to use your Z8 in a gimbal where you wanted one port to be power and then the other port to be communication to an, like an AF assist roller, for example, or if any situation where you need to use a USB-C port and still have the camera powered, if it's running from a device that doesn't deliver power directly, we now have two USB-C ports. So you can always have it powered through one and then you can have a communication or a data connection through the other. I really like the idea of that. The Z9 only has one USB-C port, which you can still charge it from, but I like the idea of having two. I suppose the biggest thing that's missing is the Ethernet port. The Ethernet port on a Z9 allowed you to connect for network devices and so on. You can now still use a USB-C to Ethernet connector if you wanted to. When it comes to the viewfinder, the viewfinder in the Z9 and the Z8 are identical. They are the same resolution, 
the same frame rate, you can choose between 30, 60 and 120 frames per second, so 120 frames per second. And they are, more importantly, the same brightness. The brightness of a viewfinder is, I think, something that's often overlooked. And the brightness of the Z8 viewfinder is three times brighter than any other competitor's viewfinder. And that is particularly important for me personally, as a landscape and a wildlife photographer. I can still see my subject on incredibly bright days when I'm dealing with bright sun. If I'm shooting on a beach or a wetland and I'm dealing with really bright, harsh lighting, the ability to have a very bright viewfinder is really important to me because I shoot with both eyes. When I'm tracking a bird in a flight, I use my left eye and my right eye to figure out where that bird is. Really useful, especially when dealing with fast moving subjects like kingfishers, for example. So I'm very happy to see that the brightness of the viewfinder on the Z8 is still the same level of brightness as it was in the Z9. I think brightness is way more important than anything to do with resolution. And the quality of this viewfinder is incredibly impressive. It's one of those things you just have to look through. It's the brightness and the quality of the optics in front of the viewfinder that make the difference. And it's a, been a pleasure to use. Overall, in terms of design of the camera, I really like it. It, at first, when I first saw it, I did think it looked a bit strange and a little bit out of place because you had this massive kind of chunky viewfinder stuck onto a smaller body. Um, but I think over time, I've kind of got used to what the camera looks like. So overall, I like the design of it. And it does, to me, look like a well-designed camera. There are a couple of things that I don't like about some of the buttons. The AF on button on the back of the camera, for me, is noticeably different to the AF on button on the Z9. Having shot Z9 pretty much exclusively, I've used that camera a lot, so I get an idea of what the texture and the textile of the buttons feels like. So the, my only problem with the AF on button on the Z8 is that it sits at the bottom of the button, it sits very flush to the camera. So it's almost like if you were to roll your thumb up the camera, you would miss the button. I want the button to kind of stick out more from the camera, if that makes sense. So I'd love a lot more travel on that button. I'd love that button to feel more responsive. The AF on button for me is a button that I'm probably pressing more than my shutter button. I use my AF on button an awful lot to control when my camera is autofocusing. So how that button feels is really important to me, and it just doesn't feel that great. That's obviously not something you can fix in firmware. It might be something that I get used to, but I just prefer the kind of the feel and the slight raised nature of the AF on button on the Z9, whereas on the Z8, it just feels like it's a little bit too close to the back of the camera body. And obviously I can assign an AF on function to lots of other buttons if I need to, um, but it's just definitely something that I've noticed. It's definitely something that's kind of stuck in my mind as I've been using the camera. I'm also extremely thankful that Nikon continue to use top plate displays. If you've never used a camera with a top plate display before, I can't stress how useful they are. The sheer amount of information that you can quickly glance out at the top of your camera, shutter speed, aperture, ISO, especially if it's tripod based, if you're shooting low down, you don't want to look at kind of a, a screen on the back of the camera. Just being able to see your key information on the top of your camera is really important to me. So I'm really happy that they've not decided to not use those screens. Obviously, it's the same as it is on the Z9. Um, it is slightly different to the screens that you'll see on your top plate of a Z7, for example, um, but I'm very thankful that we still have a top plate screen. It's worth mentioning at this point that the Z8 is also a shutterless camera, so it does not have a mechanical shutter. It is purely an electronic shutter camera. So in some images, you might see this, which looks like a shutter, but this is a sensor cover. So that sensor cover activates when the camera is turned off and that protects the sensor against dust, debris and so on. So think of it like a sensor protector. It uh, makes it easier for when changing lenses, stops dust and such landing onto that sensor itself. And that activates when you turn the camera off. But don't be confused, this is not the same as a shutter. It's just a sensor cover. The Z8 only has an electronic shutter. It does not have a mechanical shutter. One of the things that the Z8 definitely doesn't have is GPS. Whilst it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth built in, it does not have GPS built in like the Z9 does. So that could be a clear decision marker for a lot of photographers, especially if GPS is important to you. The Z8 does not have a direct GPS unit built into the camera. It can still take your location information from your phone, but that requires an app to use. So if you want GPS built into the camera, the Z8 does not have that. The construction of the Z8 is different to the Z9. The Z9 is a full magnesium alloy block, whereas the Z8 uses a mixture of magnesium alloy, which is what the front of the plate of the camera is, 
the top plate of the camera is actually made up of a new carbon fiber material that Nikon have made with a third party company. It has a proper name and everything. So it does seem like it's a new material that Nikon have made specifically for the Z8. So that it can be lighter, but also still deal with the heat dissipation and making sure that this camera does not overheat when it comes to recording for extended periods of time. That is definitely something that I'm gonna test. We're gonna do some extended recording periods to see how this camera does work when it comes to overheating, if there are any major overheating issues. I've not had any so far, and I have used it in some mixed environments with warm temperatures and cold temperatures, but we're definitely gonna take a look at that as well. And finally, also the Z8 obviously being a smaller, lighter camera body, that means it has to use a smaller, lighter battery. Yes, this does make use of an ENEL15C, which is the same battery that you'll find in Z6s, Z7s, Z5s. It's not the same as the larger, chunkier battery that you get in a Z9. So the Z9 will give you better battery life. That's a fact because of its bigger battery. In terms of battery life that I've achieved, I was originally really concerned about what the battery life was gonna be. Faster processor, stacked imaging sensor, fast readout, 20 frames per second, smaller battery, kind of didn't think that it was going to work very well but actually it, the battery life hasn't been that bad it's actually been pretty good and I've been impressed with what I've been able to get from just one ENEL15C. I want to be really clear there that if you're using the 15C you get good battery life. It's not great, it's not as good as the Z9 but if you're using a C you get good battery life. If you're using the older batteries so the 15B, for example, then your battery life is gonna be significantly reduced. The older 15B batteries do not have the same level of capacity, so you're just not gonna get the same level of battery life. So just something to be aware of, I would only recommend using a Z8 with 15C batteries, otherwise it's just gonna eat through those batteries. The Nikon Z8 can also be used with its grip, and I will make a separate video around this grip because I think there's enough to talk about with how this grip has been designed and how it works. But in this video, for the grip, it will allow you to use two batteries. So you have two batteries in the grip. They are hot swappable and you can charge directly through the grip as well. It does not let you use three batteries. So the grip itself sits in the camera. It's a, it's a, it works very nicely as a grip. Um, it's not the best full grip experience. Um, and we'll talk about that in a separate video, but you can get a grip. I've been using that grip and it will allow you to use two batteries. When it comes to autofocus, the Nikon Z8's autofocus performance is equal to the Z9's autofocus performance. It's the same focusing system. It's completely different to the focusing system that you'll find on a Z6 or a Z7, which in turn is completely different to the focusing system you'll find on a D500 or a D850. So the Z8's focusing system, same performance as the Z9, as of the Z9's firmware version 3.10. So it is the up-to-date version of the Nikon Z9 focusing system. So you're not losing anything there. It's not been hindered in any way. It's not been sacrificed in terms of autofocus quality. And if anything, using this camera over the past few months I do feel like that in some aspects this is actually a little bit faster to focus or more reliably tracks. I'm pretty sure that because Nikon tell me this is the same focusing system as the Z9 that that's probably a little bit of a placebo effect or me just kind of feeling like it's a little bit faster but something to think about because there, as I'm sure that there'll be new firmware updates for both of these cameras I'm sure that there might start to be a couple of changes. There is one big thing that is very different between them when it comes to autofocus and that is that the Z8 has a specific autofocus subject detection option. The Z8 has the traditional auto, people, animals and vehicles but the Z8 then goes one step further and has a new mode for airplanes specifically. This new airplane mode allows you to say to the Z8 that you are specifically looking for aircraft. This new airplane subject detection mode is gonna be better in three main scenarios. It's gonna be better if the subject is smaller in the frame, so it can detect a plane if it's at a greater distance or if it's physically smaller in your frame, maybe you're using a shorter focal length. It's also gonna be better at detecting airplanes in darker situations. So if there's a scenario where that plane is backlit or it might be that you're shooting sunrise or sunsets with an airplane across the shot, then it's also gonna be better in low light situations. And it's also better at detecting military vehicles 
rather than just traditional civilian jets that you'll see at a traditional airport. So it should be better at figuring out what a military airplane is versus a traditional jet. The Z9 does not have that airplane mode. I have used the Z9 at air shows and shot a lot of jets in flight with the Z9 and I was really impressed with it being able to know the difference between the side of a jet and the cockpit in the jet for example. So I'm really interested to see how that new airplane mode in the Z8 will work. It still has 3D tracking, auto area, full suite of animal detection when it comes to eye and face tracking for birds, wildlife, pretty much every animal that I've pointed it at it's been able to detect. It's been incredibly successful for me and being able to track and follow wildlife when it comes to wildlife photography. The focusing system will run at 120 focus calculations a second, the same speed as the Z9. Um, and as I say, I do feel like it's running just a little bit quicker or just a tiny bit more accurate. Maybe it's a slight tuning difference between this and the, the Z9's focusing system. But do not think that because this is a lower price point or a smaller body that the focusing system is not as good. That is not the case. Um, and in some cases, as I say, I currently feel like it might be a little bit better. But that might just be a bit of a me just using the camera and, and maybe my own interpretation seeing that rather than that actually being actual fact. Nikon are also making a pretty bold claim with the Z8's autofocusing system, and that is that it has the ability to detect the world's smallest face in the frame. So maybe another way of saying that is, if the subject is further away, the Z8 will be able to detect that face better than any other competitor autofocusing system. So if your subject is further away from you, it's not necessarily going to jump to eye detection, but it will still be able to look at the subject's face and track and follow that subject's face, even when they only cover 3% of the frame. The Z8 can see a face that only covers 3% of the frame when they are much further away from you, or maybe your focal length isn't quite right for the situation that you're trying to focus on. I do have a couple of scenarios where I've got a subject moving towards me at speed, and I'll show you that it's captured each one of those shots in focus. It works really nicely, um, especially when shooting at 20 frames per second. I've not had any issues with that. I generally tend to use um, the Z8 at 20 frames per second. I've not necessarily got a need to go any faster. So as I mentioned, I've been shooting with this camera over the past few months and I just wanted to throw some of the sample images that I've taken with this Z8. Um, by no surprise, it obviously offers fantastic image quality in very difficult situations, fantastic autofocus as well when dealing with very fast moving subjects. So I'm just going to throw in some example sample images just to show you what I've been shooting over the past couple of months. I, I think based on the locations that I've been to, I probably shot some of the best kind of pre-release pictures that I've ever taken. Um, so I'm really happy with some of the stuff that I've taken on a Z8, but hopefully it just gives you a bit of an insight into the types of pictures that you can take. 
So when it comes to the Nikon Z8 and its video capabilities, the Z8 is just as powerful as it is in stills, as it is in video. Again, Nikon haven't cut any corners here. They've not restricted you in anything. So the Z8 has all of the capability of the Z9. It can record internally 12-bit RAW at 8K, 60 frames per second. You can record ProRes RAW internally, 4K, 60 frames a second. You can record 4K 120 internally in RAW. You can do 12-bit, 10-bit. You can do 10-bit analog files. It's entirely up to you. Everything you could do with the Z9, you have the choice to do that with the Z8. For a camera body of this size and to be able to shoot 8K 60 frames per second in RAW, 12-bit RAW files is pretty impressive. The length of time that you'll be able to record for will depend on a couple of factors. Memory card size, battery life, and then also heat. I'm going to do some tests for overheating to see where the camera will cut off, but from what I've seen so far, it's not caused me any overheating issues so far. Um, and I've been impressed with how it deals heat as well. The only heat related issues I've had have been hot memory card warnings and the camera obviously can't compensate for the heat of a memory card. It depends on the brand of memory card that you're using as to whether or not you're gonna get a hot memory card warning or not. So just something to be aware of. But all of the options that you'll find in the Z9 will sit in a Z8 up to a maximum resolution of 8.3K up to a maximum frame rate of 8.3K at 60 frames per second or 4K or 120 frames per second. That is all in either Nikon RAW or NRAW as they like to call it, which is Nikon's own file format. You then have the ability to shoot in ProRes RAW internally or ProRes at 10-bit or 8-bit if you really wanted to. And again, we can all shoot that in log profile, and log profile internally. The Z8 performs at its best when recording video internally rather than externally. It can still record to an external recorder, but you're not going to be able to use all of those features, resolutions, frame rates, and so on. So just something to be aware of. For obvious reasons, you cannot record all of those resolutions, frame rates, and N RAW to your SD card. For the vast majority of the time to get the maximum out of the video, you are going to need to be using a fast enough CF Express card. Um, the camera will physically just not let you record some of those resolutions to your SD card. So you just need to be aware of that. But it generally revolves around shooting in NRAW. You can shoot standard 8K video to the SD slot if you wanted to. But as soon as you start asking it to start shooting 12-bit RAW to the SD card, it will not let you do that. You have to use a CF Express card to do that. Because the Z8 can record up to 8K in video, that also means it will allow you to do 8K time-lapse in camera. So you don't have to go and assemble the time-lapse in post-processing or on a computer. For those of you that are interested in time-lapse video, 8K in-camera, you can also do 8K HDR in-camera time-lapse if you wanted to as well. I've been really impressed with the ability to shoot 8K time-lapse in this camera. Fantastic for those of you that travel, landscape, you might want to time-lapse of the storm rolling in or a time-lapse of the Milky Way rising. That's all stuff that I've done with this Z8 and its time-lapse features as well. Hopefully you found this first look video at the Nikon Z8 useful. If you have any questions about anything around the Z8, please do put them in the comments below and I'm going to reply to those questions when I can. Um, the key thing really for me is just trying to give you as much information about this camera as soon as possible. Um, Nikon have manufactured 12,000 of these units in the first month. So if this is a camera that you want to try and get hold of, I'd imagine that again, demand is going to outstrip supply. So there are, Nik so Nikon is able to manufacture more of these than the Z9, for example, but I would definitely want to try and pre-order one of these if you wanted them relatively quickly. So if you do want to try and get hold of one of these, I would pre-order one from whatever retailer works for you. So as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you again very soon for lots more Z8 content. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.